Thank you everyone for tuning in to this special recording of an Aleph Contemporary podcast. My name is John Sharples and here we are at the Bindery in Hatton Garden on a Saturday, not because we are executing a heist, but because I'm here to talk to the artists Andrew Hewish, Jakpo Dalbello and Anna van Osterom about their exhibition Field Notes, which is currently here at the Bindery. Um, also curated by Andrew Hewish as well as being a participant. Nice to see you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Um, so, Andrew has written the text for this exhibition. and I'll just read a couple of lines from the start of it where Andrew says that these works are soundings of our times. They plunder sources using the language of collage to produce a collage of languages, written and visual. They produce for the viewer a world that is open and intriguing from conversations overheard on the subway text sliced from grand musings, glyphs and numbers dropped out of the everyday, marks from the masters and bits of canvas sewn together. And so the thing that is the, the unifying idea in this show is the idea of collage and that mixture of languages. And one thing I wanted to ask all of you is when can you first remember seeing a collage that made an impression on you, which was the first time you saw a collage work and thought, yes, that combination of elements adds something more than the individual parts. And I, I've sprung that on you, so I have a suggestion of my own, if anyone needs time to think of one. <laughs> well, I, I can see that. The yes. First, the first collage I really saw was when I was a student, and it was one of Rauschenberg. And I thought, hmm, that's also a way of making art. I had never seen something before. It was, it was in Amsterdam, I'm from the Netherlands, uh, in the Stedelijk Museum. And in the time I was studying, it was really a museum where a lot was happening. And since that time, I am attracted to collages. Can you remember the components in the Rauschenberg? Um, it was big squares and a lot of red on a huge canvas. Later I saw it and I thought, mm, not as nice as I remember, but still a very good thing. But I don't know the name of it. Jakob, can you remember? I think probably the first I saw was probably when I studied art history and with the Dadaists. I don't remember anything in particular, which one in particular, but I, I remember that I, I found this this way of putting together things that were originally part of a different context, putting them in this new context, and all this new meaning that could come out of this that I found really interesting. And, uh, and then it took me a little bit, I think, on my own practice to the introduce this way of working, but it kind of happened naturally uh, as I have a lot of different uh, visual interests and uh, you know it's, it's, it was just a natural way of bringing together all these interests within the same context. So, yeah. I've always been uh, interested in the particular inheritance that Jacopo has as a, someone born in the Veneto mm. with the first name Jacopo, like Tintoretto surname Dalbello of the beautiful so you just have this incredible weighty series of associations that you kind of have to find a strategy to almost yeah. escape from in the work that you make and, and so collage has been always a natural way for you to work with some of those inherited components yeah for sure i mean um, i work a lot with elements from the history of painting which uh, especially i mean a lot also from the, the italian context what interests me is also to bring these images away from this kind of a heavy historical, uh, you know, this way in which we look at them that is often connected to national pride and this kind of stuff, and actually reconsider for what they are, just images, you know. And when you when you just uh, you basically re uh, reconsider, you know, how they, they could then be used, basically. Yeah. Andrew? For me, I used to collect posters from the war uh, that would show their layers, so that archaeology of the city, you know, the collage of the urban, which French and Italian artists 
uh, post-war also um, exploited. But I also think some of the earliest might be Salvador Dali's montage, um, filmic scene, um, which reminds me of Anna's work here too. That it's it's collage, but it's also because of their 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 filmic structure and framing. The subtitles from a movie you're not quite sure about. Um, it allows in montage, and those two things in 20th century practice very closely together. And it urges meaning and, and archaeology at the same time, because there's always a historical drag in the elements that I use. So I'll give you mine. Uh, I was introduced to the music of Simon Garfunkel very early in my life by my mum, and I loved the piece of theirs, which is the seven o'clock news and silent night, and the, fact, the absurdity of having the newsreader read about the civil rights movement and the Vietnam War, and the very sentimental singing of silent night in parallel with something in the space between those two elements that I've always found really interesting, the fact that those two things could exist in the world at the same time, and encourages you to make a, a decision about which one is more absurd than the other. So that's in, in music, but I've, so I've always been interested in in collage as a strategy. And um, another question I wanted to, to, to float for you all is, um, is it meaningful to describe visual artwork as poetic? Um, I, have a, I have a foot in the worlds of painting and the worlds of poetry. And in both, I see the words poetic and painterly being abused because usually they use in a vague sort of meaningless way to say something of approval that borrows from the prestige of poetry as an art form or borrows from the prestige of painting as an art form without actually meaning very much. So what does it mean to describe a visual work of art as being poetic? Anyone want to take that one on? <laughs> if I think of my work, yes. I want to make the ordinary more beautiful. Um, you hear sentences in the street and you think, well, it's this. You don't know the beginning, you don't know the context, you don't know how it will end. So when it is so isolated, it becomes very poetic because the sentence is not finished. Um, and for the rest, I, I'm not poetic at all. Um, but I want to make the ordinary more beautiful. Yeah. So. In that context, poetic has something to do with beauty so, yeah, and something and, and something to do with being incomplete. Yeah, because if I'm honest, <clears throat> I find poetry hard to understand. Um, so this is very compact and I can handle this. So that's it for me. I think, yeah, what... I think what you definitely do is recruit the viewer to complete what is going on by speculating in some way. Yeah. I, I would suggest rather than incomplete, it doesn't allow completion. It leaves it open to resolve constantly and continuously. And that's the completeness of the work. And for me, the lyric comes in here, which is a part of poetry. People don't necessarily decode the line of a song, but they let it wash over and continue to, to, to generate. And so the lyrical, I think, in this show is important in all of these works. Open themselves up to the viewer, but they stay open and they, it, they, it refuses a conclusion. Mm. For me, I, I do read poetry, but I don't read it for meaning. In that sense, and in this show, you, you can see rhetoric at work, but it's a, it's a powerful rhetoric. It's a, it's a formal, formal elements in play that don't resolve, uh, but are very strong and, and, have their, and have their own language. You enter into that language, but you don't enter into it for meaning. You enter into it for lyrical enjoyment or play or or other things that, that poetry can provide. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, I don't know, I think uh, uh, images, 
suggest that some in like if if you read a poem, of course there's you know there's uh, the combination of words we try to build something which a person can refer to, and uh, the meaning of the open and uh, let uh, unfinished or you know I resolve, and I think often in in an image you you can also do that. So it, in the, at this level, I think it works or can work. You know. Poetically, if we consider this the similarity between this, you know, this, this two way of uh, building meaning, maybe. So yeah, I think uh, that could be like a parallel between the two. One of the things I think that all three of you have in common is that you provide a platform of departure from which a viewer can then feel connected to something much bigger. Uh, it reminds me of. I, I like being near to water, and I think it's because even if you stand by Regent's Canal, there's this sense that this water actually, there's an unbroken line from where you are to the Sargasso or something. Like it just allows a kind of grand departure. And that's how I feel with all of these things, which is something that's quite modest uh, and small. It connects you to something that's maybe as grand as all of human knowledge and history. Uh, and that's quite a, a trick to pull off with quite, you know, modest materials. A bit of paper, some found, found materials, some stitching. Um, do you, are you consciously playing with any of that grandeur? You talk about grand musings, um, Andrew. Yeah. As you say, these are, these are a departure of somewhere but um, they are they are all I think for all the artists in this show at least for me they are ground in their experience and as you say or as a phenomenologist would say everything is connected you get the sky the bridge the ground uh, and so given that these I think these are effective observations of it or a playing out of, of experience of the world and therefore the world is here. It might not look like the world, but as you say, hopefully it feels like the world. When you're reaching for something or associating with something more grand, that isn't just the mundane world. So in, in your collage series, the one-liners, quite a few of them have classical architecture. And it, makes me think about, well, you know, what, if, what is someone like Cy Trombley doing when they scribble the word Agamemnon into the middle of the drawing? Like, it's almost kind of ludicrously bombastic reach for something and, enormous. And, and, and history is enormous, and yeah. he's playing with that enormity, but also that history immediately, like memory or moments, escapes our grasp or retreats from us. And so I think what is interesting about all, all of the artists here using historical material or historical references is there's a retreat of, of the original history, but it's brought into the now. So the diachronic of history uh, is here. It's our time and it's its, it's time. Is it um, a confidence trick, I think, to put yourself in the, in the middle of that history and not worry about whether or not you're kind of small and insignificant. Like when you handle those big historical sources and those big historical references, mm. yeah, how do you do that without feeling ridiculous? Well, uh, I don't know. I, I, I always thought when people ask me that, I actually thought that I actually I moved to the UK and not and have detached from this kind of historical context that was the Italian context. Actually, me in the university in the UK context in which uh, it's kind of uh, art, uh, you, you know, the art you talk about is, is just contemporary also. And that actually gave me the courage basically to actually then go back to that history and be more uh, at ease with uh, playing around with it. I think that actually put away all this, this kind of uh, reverence towards it which uh, now I can come back to it and feel, you know, and play around it with humor even, you know, without uh, feeling this uh, heaviness from it. So yeah, I think it was probably, you know, the context in which I was that has facilitated this way of, uh, of looking at it. 
And, um, yeah, that's one thing I've, I've always taken from your stuff, which is that it's got an egalitarian joy in which everything is brought down or elevated to the same level. So. Yeah, I mean, what interests me is to... I, I bring all this element to this different context, so what interests me is to show that uh, visual languages from different contexts have, have the same possibility for meaning, and once you put them in for example, I put them in the, in the same painting, then they will start, uh, it doesn't matter from where they come from, they will be part of this new context and they can have a dialogue between them. So, be them numbers, letters, and maps, or a uh, fragment from a, a cartoon, or advertisement, or a word from Baroque, or anything. It creates uh, basically, I don't know, just uh, it shows that these are all different uh, visual languages that can work together or you know uh, interact together if given the possibility and by doing that you actually notice that usually the context in which they come from it's uh, you know define their meaning really strongly and in this way you know the, the meaning is sort of uh, dogmatized and by bringing them together you kind of uh, break this kind of uh, sacred uh, Textualization, basically, that they otherwise have. So, Anna, yours is, yours is a bit different in the sense that you're finding contemporary speech wherever you are in the world, rather than rather than history. And is, is, is that a deliberate choice to use something that you hear day to day rather than some of this stuff that has some of these uh, baggage that the material that Andrew and Jacopo use? Well, if I would look for sentences from <clears throat> older days, that means that I have to read. Well, I can read, but that's not the point, but yeah. that's different. Then it's already something on paper. This is just something I hear when I walk. And maybe I misunderstand, maybe I, because it's never in my own language. Oh, funny enough, when I walk in the Netherlands, and I hear things, I don't find them interesting. Because I don't know why, but I cannot do anything with it. Here, I just hear something and I think I hear this and it has a certain kind of meaning for me and I just collect them. So, so, so Anna, you, you just mind the writing down gesture. So when you're out and about, you have a notebook and you... Ooh, no, I do like this, in my telephone. Yes. With a lot of mistakes. And immediately, as soon as you've heard it, you think, right, that's the yeah, sort of... Yeah, because otherwise I forget. And, and we're here sitting in front of a, a grid of your works now, and um, I think my favourite one is the sentences that's been included is, I didn't realise that you were thinking that far ahead. And it's, um, I think it, it is poetic in the sense that it really makes use of the silence that comes before that and the silence that comes after because we're immediately dropped into this world with no context and really um, the visual doesn't provide a context either. No. If anything, it's a red herring, to use an English yeah. phrase. Um, and yeah, what well, immediately we want to speculate about who is talking to whom. Yeah. You know, I have a folder full of sentences, so I I don't even know where I heard it. No. It could be on a holiday, it could be here, I have no idea. But that's also the beauty of it, because otherwise, when I'm making my collage, I'm only thinking, oh, now I have to do something like that to go with the sentence. And that that is not working, at least not for me. It has to be as, um, what's the word? I never know what I will hear and I never know what kind of sentence will go with my collage. Um, it's not serendipity, but it's something like that. Mm. Um, yeah. And although I've said that yours is a bit different in terms of not using so many sources that come with heavy associations already, Actually, as I'm sitting here, there are exceptions to that. So running through quite a few of your works is the gentle pink of the Financial Times, or even the word 
times, I think, which it comes from, and I suppose oh, yeah. there's a kind of playful commentary on the idea of a journal of record, something as grand as setting out our times. Um, um, with the collage, I, I, I never know what I'm doing. I only know that it has to be... It has to be good in my eyes. If if I look at it, then I think, oh, no, it's not working. So, uh, the times, yeah, why did I do that? There's information here, there's data. There's a flow of data. and It's dislocated in the, in the way that Anna's using it, and that's juxtaposed with these very private dramas that are going on. And which is another form of data. Yeah. You know, there's a flow of, of it, in it, in this collage. Um, you see, if you look at it, you see someone walking, and yes. it's all in one direction. Yes. Um, yeah, we're looking at an image, and the subtitles, to use that word, say, mostly I can't talk about my feelings at all. That's fine. It is obviously all in my head. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that now. Yes. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, I'm very interested to say that you don't hear this in Dutch. You're, you know, these sentences, because you're on some in some sense it's not pure serendipity because you're actually probably slightly listening with the idea of this sort of work in mind. No, 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 no. no because then it's not it's not random because you're making a selection even when you are in the field. Yeah, like when you take a photograph. Why do you take a photograph that minute and not the other minute? Mm. It's because you see something beautiful and you want to catch that. That's the same with me. I'm just walking in the street and then hang on, what do I hear now? Oh, this is something I can use. I'm at home, I go through my folder and I think, why did I ever write this down? This is a stupid sentence. Oops, off, off it goes. So there's a constant uh, deciding for me what will work or what won't work. Uh, but I never go out with my ears like that. Right. Go, oh, maybe I can, can hear something. Which is a bit different for how you find your material, because we're talking about how you select those, um, the, the words from the one-liner series. You are actually doing something that's a sort of systematic to find Yes, those. yes. Uh, but uh, but the, the, it does chime with something that Anna said, where it's, this, this is in Anna's second language. And there are particular statements that obviously provide a sufficient difference, and and it's that maybe the distance of the language provides that sufficient difference, and then these particularly, I think, in Anna's work, they're particularly compact statements. Um, but it's that diff, that distance, and that difference that allows that selection. Yeah. And I think with my material, I look for for books from the fifties or sixties. Uh, where there is a particular kind, a, a particular way of speaking that produces a sufficient dif difference. So the statements themselves have in the same way that the images are dislocated out of history in these collages, the statements are as well. And so I look for a particular way of speaking that, that is not found now, mm -hmm. which is hieratic, declarative very self-assured, very grand, mm -hmm. uh, but also in the selection is, is for me an attachment to the line as the, in the way that it plays out theoretically in drawing and, and in practice, and it also depends on how it's printed. So if it's printed, I'd look for, for text that, it, that sits on a single line that can then be chopped but then chopped further, so that the, gra the grammar itself is deterred. It produces another difference, so it's, it's doubly different. And Yako, how about you? Is, do you have a, a system, a process for identifying the material you want to use, or is it, is it serendipity, uh, and is it luck? Or? Well, I guess it's, it, most words start with, uh, with an input, which is you know, I found something which I like, a painting which I like, or a fragment, and, and then it 
uh, try to build something from it. Uh, I usually develop quite organically and I, I have usually a big pile of books in the studio, so most of these images come from books. Uh, so I, I go to the library or whatever and, and, and then I try to look things that could, could build something with, with that original input. And with time then the image develop, I will try to usually just sketch it on the sketchbook and then I will start working. And, but of course the whole thing will actually change while I start working because the scale, the material, uh, and of paper, basically. So it, it will evolve and change into something else. So there's always an input which gives an outline of the image, of how the painting will look like. And then it's just basically materials playing uh, and developing on the canvas, basically. Do, do all of you think it helps if your audience is uh, visually literate or sophisticated in some way. I, I saw my favourite stand-up comedian last week, Stuart Lee, and he pretends to tell his audience off for being ignorant. And he at one point shouted, don't come to my shows if you don't know anything because you won't, you won't find it funny if you do. And sometimes, um, Jacopo, maybe I look, at, I look at your work and it makes me think, ooh, there's a whole... First of all, I'm very happy with myself when I am successful in the game of thinking, actually, I do recognize these elements. And so um, they are very flattering, I think, on people who get the joke. You know, people, a joke's always funnier if you're pleased with yourself for having recognized the elements. Uh, but there's always a hint to a body of knowledge that I actually don't have access to at all. You know, there's some taxonomy or reference that goes way over my head. And, um, do you deliberately put things in there that, yeah, how does it relate to systems of knowledge? And if you come ignorant, does that sort of stop you from enjoying it, do you think? Well, I don't do it on purpose. I mean, this will imply some kind of elitism, which I don't want to put yeah. forward. Uh, it's just that's what interests me, and you know, and then I, it, it, that's what I, that's the element I work with. Uh, yeah, I, th I think there are different levels in which uh, the words copyright and the, the reference and just one part. Uh, but I mean these paintings in particular are basically the construction of figures of painting. I think this is what they mostly are about. So I think uh, that could be recognized I hope even if uh, if you you know if you don't have, if you don't recognize where this image comes from or whatever, I think uh, there is a level in which uh, I hope they are um, yeah, enjoyable at that level for everyone. I mean, I try at least to engage with, with the paintings. Um, but yeah, I, I see there is definitely a danger to it. I mean, in general, with contemporary art, that it just addresses a particular um, group of people which has a particular background and so on. So yeah, that's always uh, a problem, I think. Um, but I think in the context of this show, particularly with the other works, the idea of decoding them is not the point. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So immediately I think the audience here would see that there is meaning at play, that meaning itself is being resisted, that whilst cues to meaning, such as Anna's photographs that are then blended with, with other layers, uh, there was information there, there was a, a code there, but it's lost in the layers and you're not there's no requirement to add all the decode. In fact, it, it's saying we're not decoding, we're producing something new, and, it, and that newness is a, is a pure visual enjoyment or, uh, or experience. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And you, you said something the, the other night for the private view for this show that I was interested in. So there was some debate about whether your grid of the one line of collages was itself uh, a unitary work or whether each component worked autonomously as an individual work and you were definitely clear that uh, individually they work because actually you've seen the others too so even if you take one home you carry the others in your mind in some way and it's um, it's a signpost to a bigger hinterland that you're aware of and actually that's something that could be said about all of these works which is that they function as signposts 
it's a bigger hinterland that you're aware of. That's a and, and you and you referred earlier to to a form of knowledge, and that goes to to the question around language here and how it, how it might play out. Each of these works from each artist establishes a language, a very distinct language, uh, which which could be construed as a new form of knowledge or a new regularization of knowledge. And so certainly with the one-liners, I was playing with that idea of knowledge and, and its codification. Another way in which I think it's meaningful to describe all of this stuff as poetic is in the, um, in the same way that poems by being written in certain recognized forms, like whatever it is, a sonnet or a villain album, uh, in some ways invites every other poet who's ever written anything into the room with that poem and these works by making references to, to uh, conventions that we're already aware of, but invites everyone else into that conversation, but also sends you clear of them. And I was, I think you in particular, Andrew, like I always think of you, you're very playful with what you might think of as a visual cliche. Like so these these works, the um, Cambridge Spring series and the, and the you know the having that purse series. Um, it's almost like a joke about post post impressionism. So it's <laughs> they are beautiful on their own terms, but you also definitely recognise it as being part of or a comment on our linear idea of art history that goes Monet to We Are and Bonnard and you end up with Joan Mitchell and Christopher Wall. Like it's it's a deliberate joke about our linear sense of what that is. And, and that we are bound in history. And I think, again, all of these works demonstrate, uh, as Jacob was saying, we're, we're, we're bound in history, but we can play with that and we can recognise that. We live in a world where everything is on our desktop. But as Jacob was inferring, I think, that it doesn't flatten everything to nothing. It raises everything to everything. So everything is significant. Uh, but with, the, with, the, with using... A visual rhetoric. There are there this this thread um, that that's explored consciously and, and put out there consciously is also something that that keeps space open. It's uh, certain artists have uh, certain artists close possibilities down, and no one can ever follow that. And other other artists that tend to remain in an art historical memory are ones that contribute. To that language that continue to be used and continue can continue to be vital. Yes. Um, something else I wanted to ask you all about is originality. How we how important is originality, and what does it even mean? And in my world, the, the gateway to the copyright system is that whatever you're doing has to be original. And in our in our, our Western idea of our history. Privilege the idea of art being something that is new or bought from the blue um, is different to what's come before. And so, you know, Anna, you use, um, you combine found elements. And so, how important is originality? <laughs> well, first of all, um, I stopped using images which are really recognizable because you cannot do this anymore. So I use my own photos. Um, I use my own painted material. So that's interesting. You've deliberately changed the way you work because of a kind of cultural feeling that actually you shouldn't use other recognizable images. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's a, a, a fantastic American uh, collage artist, <laughs> Sam Milton. And when I look at these collages, it's from the 70s. Mm -hmm. You see the actual magazine papers yeah. you know, ripped out, and, and you can even see the price of, of you know, uh, an, an advertisement. And I thought, well, you, you can never do this anymore. There will be certain someone suing you because you are using his image. But I, I love to look at it because it's showing you part of history. Um, yeah, I, I'm using just my own material. That's the easiest thing. And I don't want to be original. Because I don't think you can ever be really original. You're always using 
Every, everything you've seen, you're using. And that's okay, why not? You build on top of all the others. Whereas, they, they, they have already discovered lots of things. And if you use it, why not? Yeah, how, how important is No, I definitely agree with that. I think, uh, I mean, I think originality is probably overestimated, I think. Uh, um, any field, uh, you know, of, of work or, or of knowledge is always a cumulative um, enterprise. So, you know, people, different people contribute in part to it. And, and you know, for example, in the in art history, it's, it's people learning from other people and, and uh, getting influence. So you never start from scratch. Uh, just already learning a language, this is being a cumulative uh, uh, process that happened, you know, with, uh, with time. And this, yeah, I think this uh, happened in every context. I think uh, with with the copyright, of course, that's that's a, that's another way to, to formalize this kind of um, put a stamp on what original is and what is not. Which I think uh, you're very clever because you use a lot of stuff that is way out of copyright in the, in, yeah, that, in the public domain. If the artist has been dead for 70 years, then okay, that's, you're good to go. But I, I, I work also with sound and yeah. uh, I use, I, I don't know if you, if you know, uh, Plunder Phonics is, is this basically approach to music in which you use uh, fragments from recognizable on purpose yes. pieces and then you then uh, reassemble in a collage way. Yes. Which that is way more dangerous because yes. uh, a lot of these artists got sued and you know and yeah yeah culturally we have definitely arrived at a consensus that in music it's unfair to sample even the shortest of clips yeah no, just one second i think even a one second could be you yeah know, like something that uh, so yeah i think uh, i don't know um, what i use is is mostly work of the past, uh, because uh, in, in the past I was using also different influence from different contexts mm -hmm. and, and bring them into the, into my paintings in a more organic way. Now I just want to show that uh, also that art is something you know you make with a lot of influence, and I want to show this influence so directly that everyone can sort of see, oh, this comes from this, this comes from that. You can see this different. Visual language, just the play in the, in the context. And one of the things that's striking about your work to me is that despite the fact that it's grounded in remixing, it's actually very distinctively yours. And actually, um, you know, Andrew does not have a trademark visual aesthetic. Um, Anna's work is a lot newer to me, but so maybe, maybe you do have a a trademark look, but you definitely immediately you see your work and just the way in which the elements are combined, you know it's a Jacopo Dalbello, it's a kind of trademark appearance to that, yeah. and that's an interesting... I don't actually know. You don't know what, that, how what that is, no. I have no idea, I mean, that's how... I don't know. Um, I sometimes think that maybe I should try to step away from, from this recognizable right. style, even, you know, just to challenge my, you know, my own practice. Yeah. But I don't know, you know, this kind of happened organically. And that's, uh, with time it will change and evolve, but like my people keep saying that uh, it's still recognizable. That is, there is a continuity, which I guess is fine. Um, yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah, I think that's good. And so Andrew's showing three series here, and there was a lot of talk the other night about, well, could, do you recognize these three series as being by the same artist? And then some the consensus that people landed on uh, was, well, yes, they share a sensibility. Um, but so my question for you, have you ever made an original work, Andrew? Um, it, it's, not a, it's not a word that I would entertain. <laughs> no. Or, no. And, and I wonder how much play it has. I, I think there's something romantic about it as an idea. For me, well, it, it, it goes back to, the, to, your, to your intellectual property foundation um, for, for the question which is the, presumably the sufficient difference. Is, is this a sufficient difference from wherever it started, etc.? For me, that sufficient difference is in being able to step back from the work 
and think, is this sufficiently different to what I know? Mm. Or, and to me, that's, that's a personal but, but originality. Would, would you, I was going to say, but would you describe that difference, therefore, as being originality? Yes, it's certainly original from me. If I recognise too much of myself in something or anyone else's work, or uh, it's not sufficiently strange. So I would work a piece until I find it sufficiently materially strange, conceptually strange, etc., so that it carries its own energy, it carries its own world. I think what you said about Jacopo, about originality being sort of overdone and over-fetishized mm. is definitely right. I mean, culturally, we have this idea that um, ideas do come like bolts from the blue and there is not enough collective humility that you know, if we are seeing further just because we're standing on the shoulders of giants, which is the sort of thing that you were, you were getting at. Um, and even imagination is probably best thought of as being a reordering of experience than it is of actually creating something new. Like a dream is probably properly understood is a reconfiguration of memory and stuff that's you, you and experience rather than something that is a genuine new creation to the to me there is something else in that I'm always amazed when there's something new in the studio that wasn't there before that amazes me it, it's new mm -hmm. if the, uh, even, even if it even if it's a if it should if it's a chair that's based on some archetypal chair it's still new that's incredible to me that's that's creation and then yes there's the individuated qualities that you're talking about is, is another thing but yeah creation itself to me is interesting do you um, have any questions for each other based on on this exchange so, so i know that um jacopo was originally taught by andrew uh, and and anna's come in um the, because it, it's um, it is a fan. Well, what we should say, um, when, what I maybe didn't say at the start was uh, congratulations on, on such a great show. It's um, it's very sensibly hung, and there is definitely something that resonates across the work that the three of you make that, um, that works. I think one thing I would ask the other two to speak to is materiality because it's, it plays out very differently in, in the various work. Um, and, and I remember when we first talked, you talked about the transfer, various transfer methods. Do you mind yeah. just saying something about that? The, particularly the sensitivity and the laborious quality, incredibly time-consuming. <laughs> well, first of all, I like the time-consuming thing because in the meantime you can think what to do next. Um, I use transfer because what you do basically is rub a lot of the paper off your image, so the only you only are left with, with a very thin layer on which the image is, and then if you glue it on paper, it sinks into the paper. It's really very nice, and then if you can do another layer on top. And because it's so very thin, something um, from the background comes through. So you're just playing with the image while you are working on it. And for me, that that's like painting with paper, yeah, mixing colors. Uh, yeah, and sometimes it goes wrong, and I rub too much, and you rip it apart. Yeah. But that materiality and the that meditative time around that use of that material is important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because otherwise you don't look at it. Then it's like working in a factory, and mm. another one, and another one. I like, I like the way you describe it as a, as a kind of fundamentally non-intellectual thing, because of course what we've talked about is quite an intellectualized uh, account of what this work is, but you're saying that this is so, you know, you can think about something else while, you, while your hands are occupied. Well, That's it's not ironing. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, a, and again, you can't, this doesn't come across in the podcast, but as Anna mines the activity of doing this, there's a clear kind of joy in how that comes about. Yeah. No, um, no I'm always thinking, um, 
yeah. of the image because I see the image and you see it becoming clearer and clearer so that's why I never think of something else but as a result they are very flat yeah to, so to stand in front of these is it's not a big sticky mess of, mm. of cutouts put yeah. one on top of each other yeah in a way I think that, that my one liners are um, although I am also interested in that retreat of materials so as you approach them they they look and are heavily layered visually but they're also very flat and I presume that's part of the thrill yeah and also sometimes I use um, newspaper and I rip them because then the, the sides are uh, well if you cut them it's very sharp mm. but if you rip it it becomes flat and then you can use a, a paste and then it really dissolves in, in your in your image you already have and usually, when I use newspaper, that's like a color, like red or mm. blue or green. So, not recognizable. I definitely think that material lightness of touch also works, contributes to the metaphor of how open they are as works as well, and how undogmatic they are, and how, you know, they are, they do invite the viewer to, to, to resolve them. Um, what I would like the viewers to see is the moment you come in you think oh yeah yeah that's that's a room mm -hmm. and then you stand in front of it and you think a room no I don't see a room what is, what is it actually mm. that's what I want to do with my image the image I make just to um, let them look look and reconsider what they are seeing yeah and with Jacopo's there laboriously sewn together. Um, do you do that yourself? Of course, yeah. I mean, I, I, I did a few times with the sewing machine, but uh, I'm not that precise, so they all come up properly. And also, there is not uh, this, you know, the uh, artisanal kind of touch, that you can see the, you know, the, the thread going through. Uh, so yeah, there, I, uh, materiality is definitely like a big part of all the process. Uh, I try to include as many different techniques and materials as possible. Um, I started using recently um, image uh, transfer, which I, I quite like because it's never perfect and it always look a little bit, you know, like uh, there's a, some part missing, so there's, there's a, a physicality to it, which I think adds uh, something to the work. And I, uh, the background, for, for example, I would like uh, to look like uh, walls in a street, basically, like with a lot of, you know, um, sedimented uh, scratches or, you know, graffiti or whatever, uh, just in a different way. But it's just basically, you know, showing just this layer of different uh, uh, way uh, of working. Um, in this case with acrylic, oil, pencil, oil sticks, um, and so on. And, uh, but it's a, it, it's a playing with it's still the thing. idea of suturing as well, that meaning... Yeah, that's the literal yeah. suturing, You've literalized that is, as is a there, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then I do the same. So this, this kind of process happens at different levels, so the more, you know, playing around with history, uh, let's say, and then the, this the level of actually putting together physically different pieces of canvas, which is another way. It becomes know, part of a the collage, basically. Yeah, but and it becomes part of the play for, for to, to, that, to what yeah. it means to stand in front of them. It's like the literal thing of the other, basically. Different level of it. So tidy and well done now. So well made. I mean, well, it took me a while, but uh, <laughs> it was a, a learning curve. Um, in yeah, the, in the early days, and the first one I have of yours, it's kind of crudely uh, yeah. <laughs> stitched together. Yeah, over time you <laughs> refine your method, but uh, I mean, my, I use a lot of uh, masking tape, which is best, uh, my uh, most used tool, I would say. Actually, you know, to, to keep it tidy, because I tend to be quite messy, so uh, with time I learn how to, you know. But there's a lot of love in all of this, I think. Sorry? But there's a lot of love in all of the work in this room, I think, in terms of yeah. what, what the artist takes yeah. to it and the time spent with these works. Absolutely.
And I, hopefully that comes through for the viewer too. You have to stand in front of these works to get that impact. At a time when we're used to these circulation of images in the digital. Yeah, definitely. I think they all encompass that idea of slowness and uh, yeah, a longer lingering on an image than we're used to. Um, for sure. Okay. Well, on the uh, subject of a lot of love in the room, thanks very much, all of you, for coming Thank here you. today. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, enjoy the rest of the run of this show. It's on until... December 2nd. December 2nd. So, anyone's listening, do take the opportunity to come and see it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.